Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at iron and steel, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and the role of scientists. We hear first from Dr. Peter Clawton about the demands made on the iron and steel industry. I'm Peter Clawton. I'm a honorary research fellow at the University of Exeter. I've been looking at the resources required for the iron and steel industry during the First World War. The iron and steel industry at the outbreak of the war was essentially close to the coal fields for the supply of fuel and close to potential sources of iron ore within Britain. In the northern valleys of the South Wales coal field, particularly in Scotland, around the Clyde area because of the interest from shipbuilding. In England, the Midland areas around the coal fields and up the eastern side of northern England, areas like Middlesbrough and up towards Newcastle. There was a significant element of iron smelting in North Lincolnshire, drawing on ores from that area. There was no steelwork that I'm aware of in Ireland. The outbreak of the war, they were producing pig iron and steel. Pig iron is the cast iron, product of the first smelting of the iron. Some of that was used for castings and for forging after it had been refined. The rest was fed into the steel making processes. Now, Britain at this time, at the start of the war, was very reliant on imported iron ores. When war broke out on the 4th of August 1914, the demands on the steel industry were immediate. There was a requirement for vast numbers of shells. The demand for the steel for that quickly outstripped the capabilities of the steel industry in Britain. One of the problems with the demand for shell steel particularly was that it was based on a requirement for hematite steel. It was not possible to make shells from steel produced by the basic process, that is, using high phosphoric iron ores. Not only did the British iron and steel industry have to supply shell steel for Britain, it also had to supply the French, because in the early months of the war, German advances in northeast France had cut the French off from the majority of their iron and steel industry, which was based close to the border with Alsace-Lorraine. It wasn't until late in 1915 that the War Office and the Admiralty were persuaded to modify the specifications for shell steel to allow certain amounts of the phosphoric iron ores that you found in the English Midlands and in Cleveland in North Yorkshire to be used for producing shell steel. And further concessions were made in 1917 to allow even larger amounts of phosphor. You're talking 0.6 to 0.8% phosphor. If they allowed larger amounts of phosphor in the steel, they found they had problems with the consistency of the steel. It wasn't a homogenous material. That caused problems with the shells themselves in that misfires would occur, shells would explode within the barrels of guns. There was a concerted effort to improve the production of steel from the non-phosphoric iron ores, but that placed increased demands on the resources required for the industry because the non-phosphoric ores only contained around 25% iron, as opposed to hematite ores, which were around 50% iron. And so the demands on fuel and demands on fluxes to release the slag during the smelting process were much greater. Twice as much fuel, twice as much flux. You also need the materials for the linings for the furnaces, the dolomite for the basic linings, silica bricks for lining other parts of the furnaces and other specialist linings, some of which actually had to be imported because we didn't have enough in this country. This brought problems for the limestone quarries producing flux. They were short of manpower. They encouraged quarrymen to come in from less essential quarry enterprises, particularly things like China Clay working in Cornwall, to supplement the workforce in the limestone quarries, but still they were short of manpower. And in the end, they started using prisoners of war. One area of the steel industry which changed significantly through the First World War was the production of specialist steels. These were hardened steels for machine tools and armour plating. Large amount of that production was concentrated around Sheffield. 
one of the changes was the introduction of electric arc furnaces for steel melting. Electric arc furnaces were very effective. They could use large amounts of scrap steel, which put less of a strain on the demand for iron. The numbers of electric arc furnaces rose from about 16 at the beginning of the war to something approaching 200 by the end of the war. They put considerable demands on electricity supply. And electricity in Sheffield was actually rationed at one point. There just wasn't sufficient generating capacity to cope with the large number of furnaces being used. The especially steel industry also required those additional steel alloy minerals, most of which were imported throughout the course of the war. Only two of the steel hardening minerals, tungsten and manganese, were produced in the UK. There were three mines in Cornwall which produced tungsten as a byproduct of tin mining. There were also a number of other mines where the tungsten minerals would be cast to one side, thrown away, because they were a contaminant in tin. So a number of mines put in place schemes to rework the waste dumps. This involved significant numbers of women helping the men to sort through the dumps to identify these tungsten minerals and put them to one side to increase production. The demand for fuel was predominantly for metallurgical coking coal. And this is only available in certain areas of the country. And it meant you had to move large amounts of coal and coke around the country. That put demands on transport. One of the problems was that a lot of the steel firms still relied on the old beehive coke oven production. All the byproducts were lost in that, which would be extremely useful to the war effort in providing certain chemicals for munitions production. And so there was a considerable effort to improve coking facilities across the whole of Britain and build new coking ovens to supply the metallurgical coke required for smelting and the byproducts which were of use to the war effort. Overall, the operation of the iron and steel industry was left to the market. The Ministry of Munitions, formed in 1915, had some impact on the industry, but it was forever dealing with crises as they developed. It was never able to really sit back and look at a plan for the industry. The industry realised that they had to consolidate their activities. There were a number of amalgamations set in place and new integrated steelworking plants were developed. But these were hampered by the lack of labour and most didn't actually come into operation until after the end of the war. The overall benefits from the change in the iron and steel industry were not really realised until after the end of the war. The industry then shifted. We had a concentration on exploitation of the Midland iron ore fields down into Northamptonshire. Eventually, the steel industry itself moved to Northamptonshire. In the 1930s, the development of the Corby Steelworks in Northamptonshire moved the industry forward placing it in a position where it could exploit to good effect the resources in the Midland iron ore fields. There were also other benefits of activity during the First World War. A large number of publications came out towards the end of the war and into the 1920s, which provided vast amounts of information on the resources available within the UK. The research largely carried out by the British Geological Survey identified new sources of iron ore, of the steel alloy minerals. These publications were put to good effect during the Second World War. During the First World War, there were serious labour problems. A result of skilled labour, both in the mines and in the steelworks, being called up into the forces, or in the early years of the war, voluntarily enlisting in the forces. In North Lancashire, the mine manager at the Hodbarrow Mine Many of his miners actually signed up for the forces and they had to be brought back from the front in 1915 to maintain production at the mine. Lessons were learnt during the First World War in the iron and steel industries. When the Second World War broke out, occupations within that industry were protected. That was Dr Peter Clawton on the demands made on the iron and steel industry You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government.
It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Robert Newman about forestry and the demand for timber.